This episode 15 is the first dedicated to surviving the catastrophe. Long-term preparation aside, the first critical play in the game is the event itself, and on the sun, that's about knowing the signs on our star that would indicate it is indeed gearing up to prove it is a long period recurrent nova. In this video, we won't just discuss what signs to look for with a micronova, but for a magnetic pole shift as well, since it is already underway and monitoring of the pole position and field strength from official sources is spread five years apart. But we will begin with the sun. There is no doubt that the question of what the super flare or micronova would look like has many speculative answers for us sitting here today, having never witnessed one. No doubt it would be helpful to know the picture of the immediate aftermath of the miniature version of the more well-known Nova, and there is also no doubt that the actions one takes in preparation would be similar regardless of the character of the blast, the Great Flash. But what if you could have just two hours notice that it was about to happen? That's a head start to a safe location, a trip to the store without panic. What if you have a day? What if the sun gives you a year's notice? Optimally, we would have galactic scale monitoring for things like the superwave or galactic current sheet crossing. But as even Dr. Laviolette points out, we can't currently see something like that coming. While the possibility could not be ruled out that the sun would just nova out of nowhere, it is plausible if not scientifically probable that the sun would begin to change in the days, weeks, and perhaps even years beforehand. On a short scale, there is the rotation speed surge we looked at in a previous episode. Even a decade ago, the technology existed for the public to monitor our star in unprecedented detail, in numerous wavelengths of light, from numerous spacecraft, and while none of those satellites are likely to survive a micronova or a super flare, they can certainly allow us to watch up to that point. If we are looking not for a rotation change, but a slight change that builds to a nova, perhaps with the photosphere eventually crusting and reddening. There would unquestionably be ion signatures beforehand, and the angstrom views many of you are already using to monitor every day are what we'll use as the canary in the outer shell coal mine. The ionized iron views, the yellow, bronze, and pink, 171, 193, and 211 angstroms respectively, look for very specific energetic ions of iron. These are likely to be the first to react to any electromagnetic change, and we already know what both sunspot maximum and minimum should look like here, and any density or field revealing changes amidst these wavelengths would be an electromagnetic disaster in the making for the solar system, but would be shown well ahead of time. Alternatively, in that crust-up scenario, the H-alpha view of ionized helium should reveal a drastic change in color, and perhaps even altitude or elevation depending on how you prefer to view the chromosphere. And then there's the ones we don't see as often, the higher wavelength views looking for either ionized carbon or the continuum of elements, which would need to be changing drastically in brightness and small scale morphology, perhaps even at the granule level, in order to get the glass component of a micronova for example. We'll catch that if it happens here, along with the others, and some of these changes might precede a nova or even the hypothetical crusting event of the outer shell by months time. All in all, if there is any plasma universe physics at work to the event, satellites like the SDO, GOES, SOHO, PROBA, and more are going to let us see this happening. And as you know, we analyze the sun every morning, right here. It has been about 10 episodes since we mentioned the comet instigation hypothesis, which does tie up a number of catastrophist theories into a nice neat package, and for that it really just depends on how early we see the comets coming. Good news there is that it wouldn't be your normal sun divers, they'd have to be very numerous or of great, great size, and so that means one to two years advance warning is not out of the question. Up next, the super flare, and how would you see this coming? This would be the event mainstream science says is not only possible, but maybe on as short a time scale as 800 years, as we saw in episode 14, and which could reach a hundred times the strength of the Great Carrington event in 1859. Something in the few thousands to around 10,000 years might even be more reasonable, but either way, the super flare is a real, recognized risk from our star, and in terms of the nearest event like that in the past, we look back beyond the Carrington event in 1859 to the 700s, 
when what is known as the Charlemagne event or the Charlemagne solar event is thought to be from twice as strong to up to 10 or 20 times as strong as the Carrington event was. This would destroy the global power grid, melt most wires, drop every airplane, pacemaker, cell phone, and the good news is that the sunspots need to be born and develop or they need time to rotate into earth-facing position. Might not seem like much of a consolation, but both of these facts means that neither newborn sunspots nor existing ones can really sneak up on a diligent space weather observer. Baby spots take time to grow. Existing sunspots take three to five days to enter the danger zone when they rotate in. And thanks to the automated detection systems like our global high watch alert on the disaster prediction app, which is solely based on the appearance of a sunspot surge, checks all day, every day, as well as sends alerts for any significant solar flare activity, there is almost no chance that a sunspot group capable of a super flare would not have triggered one of those alerts in the hours if not days beforehand. Again, giving that short time jump on the rest of the human race. When it comes to the magnetic pole shift, there are two kinds of evidence to track, the official evidence and that which you have to interpret. The official world magnetic model only comes out about every five years. We seem to get updates on the field strength even less often. In the short term, we have been tracking the relative effects of space weather since 2014. The effects of smaller, more regular space weather events like solar flares and coronal holes can be very telling of the field stability over those short periods. The trends we have seen so far is that the lesser and less powerful space weather events are now able to cause the kinds of effects on Earth in the weather and technology that have previously been described as being attributable to much grander events on the Sun. This was especially true for an uptick on the Sun and Earth in the northern summer of 2015 and for a colossal three-week barrage from the Sun in the fall of 2017, coincident with the run of Tropical Storms Harvey through Maria in the Atlantic. Two of the videos in this very playlist, Energy from Space and the Number One Risk to Earth, contain a lot of the space weather effects tracking of the magnetic reversal information for the last few years. Of course, if you get mass animal navigation chaos across the globe in one day, auroras at the equator, and melting change in your pocket, Maybe you don't need space weather to tell you what's happening with Earth's magnetism. Until that day, we'll keep watching. I want to end here by considering a last thing that will probably seem obvious, but if something like a micronova does sneak up on us without warning and you're lucky enough to be on the night side when it flashes, take but a moment to enjoy the splendor and then get going, and be thankful you did not see what the other half of the world saw their normally yellow sun, which had begun to shine so bright white that its rays appeared as a crown turned red, and took with it the peace and civility of the people. Then perhaps as it turned black, they might have seen the sun's version of the energetic Van Allen Taurus, like the balances of a scale. And finally, the return to a paler, dusty view of the yellow sun they remember from childhood. But hell is following with it. The next episode will really dig in to survivors of past events. Here's some bonus material from Dr. Dunning. Be safe, everyone. What were all these ancient people saying? What were all these people trying to remember? We must take the words left to us in generations of oral histories and written records of observations in the sky as instances of events that were not the norm. They were so important and unusual that they have come through time as warnings left by our brothers and sisters, the ancient past. These events were not lunar eclipses or earthquakes. Now in this time, with our understanding of celestial mechanics, atmospheric, and geological sciences, we must try to make sense of these recorded events and untangle them from worship and prophecy. It's time to look at them for what they actually provide as a roadmap of things to come. We can ask the question, has the Earth stopped rotating for any length of time in recorded history? And the voices call out to us from the ancient Middle East. The book of Joshua in 1405 BC. O sun, stand still over Gibeon. O moon, over the valley of Aijion. 10.13 the sun stood still, and the moon stood motionless while the nation took vengeance on its enemies. The event is recorded in the scroll of the upright one. The sun stood motionless in the middle of the sky. It did not set for a full day. And those same voices call out to us from ancient Peru. Also in 1405 BC, the 40th Inca Capac was Pachatuti, the reformer that started the worship of the sun god Inti. In 1405, there occurred a frightening darkness. Quote, good customs were forgotten, and people were given to all manner of vice. 
There was no dawn for 20 hours. After a great outcry, confessions of sins and sacrifices and prayers, the sun finally rose. Has the world experienced a global cataclysm before? And will it happen again? And what was remembered and how is it described to begin again? The voices call out from the ancient American Indians, and this is the ninth and last sign. You will hear a dwelling place in the heavens above the earth that shall fall in a great crash. It will appear as a blue star. Very soon after this, the ceremonies of my people will cease. As this cataclysm happened before, the voices call out from ancient China. There were seen fire-breathing dragons leaping into the sky. They call out from ancient Siberia. The earth was on fire from both horizons. And they call again from the ancient past in the voices of the Inca. At the Intihuatana was a stone cut with great precision to observe and measure the movements of the sun. The name meant that which binds the sun, and it makes it return, at least it disappear, returning the earth into a darkness that had occurred once before, according to the legends. Did the Inca, Chinese, Siberians, and the rest remember the last Micronova event? in their oral histories. We need to take these people seriously. 